Most people, this miracle is simply not accessible. The Arabs at the time the Qur'an was revealed had been prepared for the Qur'an. There's anybody that looks at this has to marvel at the timing of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an comes at a time when the Bulagha, these eloquent masters of, of Arabic and the ability, nobody, if you read Yahali poetry, nobody in the history of the Arabic language was more adept at descriptive language, at, at just perfect language to describe something. So when they described the desert sands, they gave descriptions that you cannot improve on. They had a rhetorical prowess that was unmatched in the history of the Arabic language. In the same way that one could argue that English reached its pinnacle during the time of the Elizabethan period. And nobody has come up with poetry that is the equivalent of Dunn or Shakespeare or a little bit later Milton, uh, his period. But that, that period of the English language is unparalleled. Uh, the, the next closest thing is probably some of the 19th century writers. But uh, English now has fallen on hard times. I mean, there just aren't very many uh, eloquent uh, writers anymore in English. And what passes for great writing is, is quite, uh, quite extraordinary. So if you look at English literature, you will see that, that, that every great l language has a period of time when it, it just reaches its, its uh, culminating uh, apex. Uh, Persian languages like that with the great P Persian poets who are also around the same time. The, um, the Greek language during, during the period of, uh, of Homer uh, and then also later to a certain degree during Plato's period. So the Arabs, this language had reached this pinnacle and right at the, and what's fascinating is almost all of the Jahadi poets die right before Islam comes. And then there's nobody to parallel, uh, parallel them after Islam. There's great poets, Abu Nuwas and Ibn Burd and, and, uh, and Mutanabbi. I mean, there's great poets, but none of them can compare to Imr al-Qais or Labid or Nabigh al-Dibyani, uh, none of them. So when the Quran came down and the Arabs heard it, these were people that were speaking in their normal language, the language that they obtained from their mothers. And all you have to do is read the, 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 the Arab, the Arab, the Bedouins who relate hadith. Just anybody who studied Arabic, for you who study Arabic, look at the hadith of Halima Sa'diya. Look at the way she speaks. Look at the hadith of Aisha bint Abi Bakr. Look at, look at the hadith of Umm Zara'a. Look at some of Aisha's khutab. Aisha knew all of the Jahali poetry by rote. A Muawiyah once asked one of his uh, boon companions, Nadim, who, who's the most eloquent person you've ever heard? He said, Wallahi anta ya amir al mu'minin. You know, you are. And he was very eloquent. And he said, I want you to be honest with me. He said, well, in that case, he said, I've never heard anybody more eloquent than Aisha, the daughter of a Siddiq. And if you look at Aisha's speeches, they're stunning expressions of the Arabic language. These people could do this naturally. It was not, there was no tekelluf in their speech. They weren't, they didn't have to sit down and write speeches and, and work out rhetorical artifices and uh, tropes and figures, uh, you know, to, to impress people. All of that came later. When they, when they examined their language, they said, oh, this is, this is called antithesis. This is called, uh, you know, tibaq. Uh, uh, this is genas. Here's alliteration. Those were all, they came later. They were doing this naturally. They didn't need to study rhetoric to learn how to do these things. They got them from their mother tongue. So when these people first heard the Quran, they, they were overwhelmed by it. They, first of all, they said, 
This is not the speech. This is not something we've heard before. They had three types of language. They had nathar, which is prose. They had saja, which is almost like what, what we call today rap. It's, 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 it's not poetry, but it's using a lot of rhyme. And, uh, and, and the Arabs liked it in their khutab. The, the, uh, the, the kahinas used to use it. These, these soothsayers used to do it. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it almost sounds a little bit, um, you know, subterranean homesick blues. It, it just sounds uh, a little bit like uh, somebody's just trying a little too hard. But the, uh, and then the third was shi'r. And then shi'r had what were called abhur, which are the, the bahar, the meters. And, and they had, their meters were qualitative, they were of time duration, and the Arabs could do this naturally. And this is why you have Arab poets that could just say a poem without any difficulty, completely spontaneous. Uh, sp spontaneous. Many, many examples of this. And uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya is very, very capable of doing that. He, he can he can say something in, uh, in meter. It just like uh, uh, people that really master Shakespeare have no difficulty uh, uh, extemporaneously speaking in iambic pentameter, which is a natural uh, form of speech, but it's only one bahar. These people could do many, many of these uh, meters. So the Arabs, uh, when they heard the Quran, they said, this is a, this is a sahir. And the reason they said he was a magician was because they saw the effect it was having. It was like a magic on people. People were becoming mesmerized by it. Even people that didn't really, weren't interested. The Quraysh, at one point, they were giving people cotton to put into their ears when they went into the haram because they did not want people to hear the Quran because they knew they'd get influenced. And some of these people would go in and they'd just take it out to listen because they, you know, curiosity killed the cat. So they, they would do that and, and people became Muslim that way. The woman and nasi man yashari lahu wa hadith li yudullu an sabirillah. You know, amongst the people are those who purchase empty vain talk. When, when they used to go listen to the Prophet, one of the Quraysh, got some per, uh, Persian storytellers that used to tell the, the like stories of the Persian kings to sit on the road to try to distract people, uh, to give them stories about things. So they were very worried about the impact that this was having on them. Even at Walid ibn uh, Mughira, who was the, the father of Khalid, Al Walid was, was one of the most eloquent of the Quraysh, and when, when he heard the Qur'an, he was overwhelmed by it. And he, he said that this, this Qur'an is, is, is just something very, very uh, captivating. And, and it was uh, Abu Jahal convinced him, you know, he's, his magic's getting to you. But he almost became Muslim just from hearing the Qur'an. Fasda bima tu'mar, when one of the Arabs came into the, the uh, the, the, uh, the haram, he heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting some verses and he went into sajda and somebody said, D did you become Muslim? He said, no, but I was compelled by the eloquence of that language just to do that. So this is the effect that this was having on them. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ generally would do.